Welcome to uh, Seventh Day Baptist Church or Seventh Day Baptist Fellowship of Phoenix, or uh, our service today on July 20th, 2024. Just to get that in the record. Anyway, I'm glad to see all of you here today. And I'll just go ahead and uh, do an opening prayer, and then we can do our first hymn. Our Father in heaven, we uh, come to together again today in your name to worship you. We uh, are so grateful for, that you gave us a Sabbath day for us to just put aside all the concerns of the world, especially this week. And we just uh, like you to ask you to come among us, send your Holy Spirit with us, to encourage us, comfort us, and let us adore you, Lord. In your name, Jesus. Amen. So our scripture reading today is from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable, abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So our um, sermon today it's going to be about hell. And uh tell you the truth, initially I uh, was just to stay focused on that and uh, not talk really about the momentous events of the past week. But, uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, I'll, I'll get to why I changed my mind, but uh, I decided to go ahead and say just a little bit in the beginning about you know, our present situation. And then uh, last night when I was writing this sermon, I ended up with uh, a whole page, and it's not double spaced or anything. But so. This may end up being most of the sermon, but that's okay. It kind of at the end dovetails in with the uh, topic of our sermon. And uh, basically, uh, I'm sure you all remember what happened a week ago. Um, last week after church, I decided I'm going to get out of the uh, burning hot desert drive up to the mountains. So I headed up Highway 87 up to Payson. And uh, I was uh, listening to the radio and then I thinking about things and then I thought, wait, I think I just caught the last like, tail end of a news blurb and I thought, that, that almost sounded like Trump has been shot. I didn't seem too frantic or anything or too depressed, so maybe he wasn't that, but of course I pulled right over and got on my uh, my phone, my connection to the rest of the world, and found it, it had just happened. Of course, I think you guys remember that I started texting you and texting my family, and uh, uh, while I was texting my family, there's a couple of members of my family, uh, shall, we say, shall we say, don't see eye to eye with uh, 
me and most of the rest of us about certain issues, political issues. Now, they didn't say anything bad about, you know, Trump or they, they certainly did not express any joy that he'd been shown. But you could tell they just weren't, uh, it was really as impressed with him as the rest of us were. And so I wanted to say something to them, let them know that really wasn't the issue as far as I was concerned. Let me see if I can find the text. And uh, there it is. I just, I texted this to them. I said, I started off saying something that I found myself saying more and more lately. I'm old enough to remember. <laughs> I never used to say that, of course. Lately, I just say it more and more. So anyway, I texted to them, you know, I'm old enough to remember how it affected everyone when assassinations started happening, regardless of what you thought of the person killed. I remember what it was like, wondering when the next one would happen and if it would ever stop, or if that's how we would choose our leaders from then on. We cannot go back to those days. We cannot go back to those days. You know, I'm also old enough to remember how our society started getting more and more polarized a while back. I, and to tell you the truth, uh, I know, I'm sure all of you in here are aware of that happening because you, all of you have watched it getting more and more polarized the last decades, but I'm old enough to remember when it started getting polarized more and more. You know, just to, we're, what people believe and what is important to them and, and what they think about why we are here is just diverging more and more and more, and it I remember when that started, and and through the you know seventies and eighties, you know people were talking about it. How society is polarizing, and they aren't talking about that anymore because it's just kind of become part of the air we breathe. <laughs> you know, just and and the thing is. It's, it's led to a lot more acrimony and a lot more conflict between us and society. And it just occurred to me that to a lot of people, it might seem like that conflict and the acrimony is going back and forth is what's causing us to become polarized. And looking back on it, I don't think that's the case. I think it's the other way around. We really are, you know, our feelings and our thoughts and our beliefs really are heartfelt and genuine, and they're polar opposites to one another in society. And that's leading to the conflict. And I just, started wondering, you know, well, how will we come back together? How will we come back together? You know, as far as the conflict between us goes, I'm old enough to remember when all of us really would have, we would have disagreed with each other vociferously but pretty much all of us agreed that we would die 
to defend one another's right to disagree, or at least that's what we all said. <sighs> we used to say things like, well, it's not the ends we disagree about, it's the means of achieving those ends. Pretty much all of society wanted the same thing you know, for us, freedom, liberty, dignity for all people. And now our differences, our sincerely held beliefs seem to be irreconcilable. So what do we do? And uh, I think I've mentioned, you know, J. Warner Wallace, some of his teachings that I've, that have been important to me. One of them is he, he, he talks about the different categories of uh, believers that we need to keep in mind while we're considering reaching out. And they're the same categories that he would have to keep in mind while they were trying to figure out what kind of jury to put together in a certain trial. He was a cold case detective and uh, he had to help pair, you know, prosecutions. And he said they categorized people in four ways. You had the one, two, three, four. Number one was someone who had already, you know, you look at a juror, potential jurors, and, you, and he, he, the point he was making is that the, the uh, case is not won or lost by the evidence you produce. Although, just like with us, when we are reaching out to people, we have to be prepared to give evidence. The Bible even says that. But that's not really ultimately what convinces people. For us, it's the Holy Spirit. When he was looking at a potential juror, he, they would just see how they were predisposed. To uh, and he had certain jurors that you know were just predisposed to certain viewpoints of any trial. So they had to pick them carefully because it didn't even matter about the closing arguments they made, although they had to make good closing arguments. So it didn't even matter what judge you got. What really mattered was what jury you got. And both the defense and the prosecution looked at jurors and said, okay, you got these four categories. As far as the uh, prosecution was concerned, the number one was someone who's already there. They are a believer. They, 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 they walk in and they see someone sitting over at the table with the defense, sitting by a lawyer, especially if they're wearing an orange jumpsuit. They're guilty. They're, they're gone. That's it. Well, of course, the prosecution would like to have that guy on the jury, but the defense was not going to allow it. Then you had a number, a category two, a person who was, eh, they, they pretty much thought that, that uh, you, uh, you know, that, that, that they wouldn't really pros bother prosecuting someone unless they were probably guilty, but they were open-minded. They would consider the possibility that they, they were not guilty. So of course, the uh, prosecution wanted them on the jury. And the defense wanted the category three. The person was like, had some bad issues with you know the law or the cops and, and just was predisposed to think, well, they're probably not guilty. But they wanted to be fair. They wanted to be objective. They would consider the possibility but they were. Of course, the prosecution would be willing to have them on there. Then you had category four. As a person that walked in and they'd had a lot of trouble with the law or whatever. They just philosophically, they just, you know, like nowadays, you know, it's been more and more common for politicians to say, well, we shouldn't be prosecuting these people because they're a downtrodden of society. They don't deserve it. They, you know, if they did something, it's because they were driven to it. And so, of course, the prosecution did not want them on the, on the uh, 
jury. But that's who I'm talking about here as far as outreach goes and apologetics and just theologically is that fourth category for us who says, you know, they just, they don't believe. They don't believe. We have them. And there's the other side of society that has the number one category that has, they think, you know, they're with us all the way. And, you know, how do we bring those two together? And the only way to do it is, and Jay Warder Wallace made that point, is we pray for the person who just was like, who is like I was once, just absolutely hardcore atheist. We pray, we try to model. Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent here, but we're getting to a point, I promise. So, the reason I decided to go ahead and add this, you know, very, very short prelude to my sermon was because I'm, I'm, well, when my mom was in memory care, there were uh, a couple children who were brought there to the uh, facility on a regular basis by their mom. And these, these two children were prodigies. They were homeschooled. They were smart. They played different instruments. And they, they'd bring those instruments, and they would play music for everyone there and uh, even sing for them. And that was just such a joy, a blessing to everyone there to have children, young children. who You know, they never hardly saw young children there to just be nice to them. Anyway, they belonged to a Messianic church. This is long before there was a Seventh-day Baptist church here in Phoenix. I lived up in Flagstaff anyway at the time. So I decided to, you know, check their church out. And I did. And I got on their mailing list. And that's what led to this prelude to my sermon. Is This week they sent me a uh, scripture verse. But they sent it as prayer for our nation. And I'd like to read that scripture verse now and offer it up as a prayer. We could do that together. It's Psalm 5, verses 8 to 13. I just had to read this today. O Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my foes. Make your way straight before me. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall. In the multitude of their transgressions, thrust them out, for they are rebellious against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. And may you shelter them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For it is you who blesses the righteous man, O Lord. You surround him with favor as with a shield. Amen. So that what that said to me is this, no matter how trying times are, if we are God's own, if we walk in his righteousness, 
even if we suffer, our foes will be defeated. There will be a judgment by God. But in this world, we can persevere. So anyway, that kind of alludes to the judgment of God, so it kind of dovetails in with the sermon. And I realize we got started late today, and I've already done a short sermon length sermon, so I'll try to get through the rest of it quickly. It'll probably be, end up being less than half the sermon. But anyway, let's go back to Revelation 21. And I'd just like to read. Now, that's our scripture reading was verse 8, but I'd like to read the whole 1 through 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready for, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death so I was Trying to get some verses, you know, that told us what hell is. That, that, that tells us that hell actually is. But when I read that last verse, but for the cowardly and the unbelieving and so forth, I thought, cowards? They're going to go to hell? Because that, that really scares me. So I'm scared of going to hell for being a scaredy cat. But that's not what he was saying. I am uh, talk about what courage is, the opposite of cowardice. And uh, I have two working definitions. One, and they're basically the same, but one of them is from uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Courage is not having the strength to go on. It is going on when you don't have the strength. That's a good definition of courage. And when I was in the army, I was taught that the working definition of courage for the military was management of fear. Not being not afraid. So, I think... Uh, that refers, we could look at the, like, verse 7 there. He who overcomes will inherit these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. So I think it's saying that we have to overcome our fear. We cannot be cowards. Or we will go to hell. But what is hell? Well, studying for this, I... So there's three basic definitions of hell, three views of hell. 
you had the traditional view. In my notes, I have in parentheses ECT in it. And I would look at it just now, I thought, et cetera. What am I? That's not the abbreviation, it's uh, eternal conscious torment. That's tr traditional view of hell. Look at Matthew 25, 41 to 46. Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick? Or in prison and did not take care of you. Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it for, do it to the, I try to do that again, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So we have that passage starting out with eternal eternal fire, eternal punishment, and ending with you know eternal punishment, but the alternative eternal life. And I was struck by you know what these verses say you have to do to avoid hell. Because I I see people who are hungry and homeless, sometimes even half naked in despair, and occasionally I'll help someone, but not usually. I mean, we can't all help everybody, or we would end up hungry and naked and homeless. But I, I, I looked at this and I thought, okay, he's not just talking about that. He's not just being literal. He is being literal here, I think, in that, when we are able to, we should help those in despair. But I think he's also being metaphorical there with us sharing the word. Everyone who is unsaved is in despair and facing despair for the rest of eternity. And we need to witness to them so they can avoid that. Anyway, that's the traditional view of hell. Then you have annihilationism. And universalism, and you have two different kinds of each. Annihilationism is just the, the belief that the unrighteous they disappear, they they're uncreated, they don't exist anymore. The the alternate version of that is well, you go to hell for a while until all the sinfulness is burned out of you, then you disappear. And universalism is kind of the same, except the opposite. Universalism is that we all get to spend the rest of eternity with God, whether we're, whether we're saved or whether we've committed ourselves to Christ, whether we've acknowledged God or not. Now, there's two kinds of that. You know, this one that just says this, that's just how it is. The other one that is becoming more and more popular in the Protestant circles now that comes from actually from Catholicism is the idea of a, a purgatory, a, a time in a limited time in a not as unbearable form of hell until you get all the sinfulness burned out of you. Then you get to be with God forever. And I thought, well, does that even make sense? I mean, God to just say, okay, well, I'll have a limited punishment for your sins. Because I had always been taught that our sins, you know, we, we mean that we have fallen infinitely short of God's righteousness. Infinitely. Because that's how righteous God is. He's infinitely righteous. And he's perfectly righteous. And I thought, well, 
a, a being that is perfectly righteous can countenance no sin, no evil. It has to be dealt with one way or the other. And if he's infinitely righteous, that's scary because if we are not perfectly righteous, we have fallen infinitely short of his standard. If, if there was one of us besides Jesus Christ who was morally perfect, perfectly righteous, we wouldn't have to worry about being infinitely less righteous than God because we wouldn't be any unrighteous in ourselves at all. So there'd be nothing to punish, but none of us are like that. So I don't think that hell will be, un will be limited. And even though I am terrified of the prospect of hell, not for me, I'm, I'm, I'm confident in my salvation. But the thought of anyone being an eternal, unbearable torment terrifies me. But even so, I think I've mentioned to you somebody before, maybe during Bible study, but the alternative is e almost more terrifying to me. If God does not punish evil, then he's not righteous. And I can't bear the thought of an unrighteous God. And I tell you the truth, I think even the people in hell, as much as they will regret getting themselves sent there, they won't be able to stand the thought of an unrighteous God, a God who will not punish them forever for evil, because just the thought of an unrighteous God is too much. So, if God is righteous, I think the traditional view of hell must be real. But so is heaven. So is heaven. All sin will be punished. The only question is, will the sinner be punished? Or has Christ already taken the punishment for us? God's moral will is, is different than his sovereign will. His moral will is that all of us will be saved. I mean, that's the standard he set. That's his desire. But his sovereign will is that he will let us decide if we will bend the knee to him and beg his mercy and commit to him. And then he will save us. And to tell you the truth, I think that apart from God's grace, none of us will bend the knee and beg for forgiveness. That's controversial. Some people believe otherwise, but I believe God has to move our hearts. I don't believe we are capable of turning to him apart from his grace. It's the old metaphor of putting a bowl of ice cream and a bowl of broccoli in front of a two-year-old and saying, you can choose whichever one you want. And you know which one is going to be chosen, just like God knows. But in and left to our own vices, we will not choose him. But still, you're not choosing the broccoli for that two-year-old. That two-year-old is choosing it, just like we choose not to come to God. We, our only hope is that God will do what we should do for that two-year-old and say, okay, yeah, but you got to eat. Oh, I'm sorry, the two, I said the two-year-old chose the broccoli. Two-year-old chose the ice cream. We're the ones that need to say, okay, well, you got to eat 
this or something like it first. Just like God comes to us and says, moves our heart to him. So our duty is to, to set that choice before those who we are obliged to witness to. I think we are obliged to witness to as many as we can. And we won't make the choice for them. We can prove to them that they are doomed, that we all are doomed if we are not forgiven. But God, the Holy Spirit, will be the one that moves their hearts. But God works through us. We take God's word to the others. And God will right every wrong, one way or the other. Either we will be saved and Christ will take the punishment for us, or God will inflict the punishment. He will right every wrong. And I can't bear the thought of a God that he would not do that. So God be praised.